Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the new school. Welcome also to those who are joining us in the live stream. Uh, this is uh, a great occasion for us to welcome Les Grands Tables du Monde here in New York City and here in our school, also in collaboration with our friends at the James Beer Foundation. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of words for those who are at home about what we do here. Uh, we have a food studies program. We have a BA, BS, and AAS. Uh, we open classes also to the general public. This has been part of our uh, tradition here at the new school since uh, its foundation almost 100 years ago uh, now. And we really want to uh, work with uh, the culinary world, restaurants, and chefs. Actually, many of our students come from that world. So f for us, this is a great opportunity to reconnect and strengthen our ties with that, uh, that world. And uh, to start, I'd like to call uh, Nicolas Chatenier, who is the uh, managing director of the Grand Table du Monde. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabio. So hi everyone, um, just a quick word about Les Grands Tables du Monde. Um, we were created in 1954 and, um, and we, we gather uh, now 175 restaurants in over 26 countries and it's, we're only talking about fine dining and multiple Michelin star uh, restaurants. And our objectives uh, behind uh, Les Grands Tables du Monde is really to promote the fine dining industry and to ensure that uh, Fine dining restaurants are, you know, keep growing and going and going. And for us, a great restaurant is amazing food, excellent service, in in a great location. That's basically the three components uh, we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, just just a quick word about this 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 conference. Um, we wanted. We think, and we shared a lot of uh, discussion with, with Mitchell Davis from the James Beard, for, uh, James Beard, uh, for, um, James Beard. Uh, basically we, we think that uh, this is a, an industry that is badly in need of discussions, questions. Um, it's an amazing industry. It's, it attracts a lot of people, a lot of chefs, a, a lot of attention. But it also needs, uh, from time to time, time to think through uh, the main challenges that it, it is facing. So that's the, uh, the main idea uh, we wanted to, uh, to have behind those, those discussions. And what we, want, what we are expecting from, from those discussions today is really heated arguments. We really hope that the panelists, uh, they're going to be uh, you know, sharing, um, even you know, uh, confronting those ideas, because we think that's, <laughs> that's the future of the industry that we are we're talking about. Um, Last, just to, to conclude, a, a few words of thanks to uh, Fabio and, to, and Pamela of the new school to, to accommodate us here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great location and we're so glad to be able to mix uh, fine dining and education. Uh, a, a great thanks to Mitchell Davis and James Beard because he, he's been instrumental in setting up um, all this. And to the, um, to the team, um, my team, Julie, and also um, the team at uh, Care of Chan because they've been you know, helping us setting up this, this, um, this conference today. So hope you enjoy a great conference. And now I'm, I'm calling Mitchell to, uh, to set the, the context. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, first things first, if you haven't figured it out already, um, this device will translate from English to French and from uh, French to English. You have to turn it on. There's an on <laughs> button. And uh, channel one is English, channel three is Francais. Canal trois. Um, really excited to be here and, as Nicolas said, to engage in what I hope will be a provocative com series of conversations this afternoon at a at a summit about fine dining. Uh, the James Beard Foundation is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, um, although we continue to be a center of fine dining and what we call American gastronomy. Many of you were just with us uh, for hamburgers and french fries from the Shake Shack. Uh, after having watched a movie this morning of Gualtiero Marchesi, who uh, redefined Italian food and, and established a notion of, of eating in Italy, alta cucina, or whatever you'd like to call it. And I think that somewhere between those hamburgers and French fries and that alta cucina is where gastronomy 
today is now. And so I'm really honored to welcome my panelists, if they'll come join me on the stage. Um, uh, as, as since they're, they're gonna come up a little bit like a, like a procession, I'll, I'll bring up uh, Alex Dupak, who, uh, please, <laughs> can take a seat. Alex from Pastry, thank you. Um, I'm going to sit too. From, um, from the pastry kitchen, it's kitchens at some of the most uh, innovative and disruptive restaurants um, the United States and the world has seen at Alinea and WD-50, um, he left to open a, a, a taqueria, uh, more or less, um, and now is the uh, chef and owner of, a, of um, evolution of that restaurant, Empeon Midtown, uh, which just received three stars from the New York Times, so thank you for joining us. Next, Soa Davies. So, uh, who is the um, most recently chef of Maple, uh, talk about an innovative dining concept, which um, was the ghost restaurant uh, that had no restaurant, had no chairs and tables, but um, was set up as a technology solution to delivery and to the, the statistic that I think is part of this conversation that uh, just came out, 52% of meals are consumed at home. Um, those are not meals cooked at home, those are meals brought to homes in America, at least. Uh, but your pedigree includes Le Bernardin, having produced Avec Air, so you are not unfamiliar with the, um, the highest levels of gastronomy and the most innovative, so thank you for joining us. And last, Julien Royer, uh, chef of the Michelin two-star Odette in Singapore with his wife, where um, one of the fastest uh, recipients of two Michelin stars ever, I think, nine months uh, or something I read. Yeah, something like that. So I want to start this conversation about gastronomy now by asking all of you uh, one ob quick observation, and that is, uh, in the last three years, you've all had extensive careers. What has been one thing that has surprised you about uh, food in, in, in your restaurants or in your purview that you just, when you started out, you just would never have expected? And I'm going to start with you, Julianne, because you've come the farthest from Singapore. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. Thank you. Well, um, I think for, for me as, as a young chef and as, as, a, as a young restaurateur, what really surprised me and amazed me over the last uh, few years, I mean, it's that things are moving fast and it's that things, expectation of people, it's changing, I believe. I think there is a, one main notion that I've personally noticed is that uh, the time is crucial in uh, our industry, especially in fine dining restaurants which is <coughs> what I always did and what I love. But I think what's important in our, our um, segment of clientele is that even though we sell fine dining food or fine dining service and trying to create experiences, the time is uh, crucial and people basically don't have time anymore. So even at the highest level, you're saying the sh Absolutely. shorter is Ab better? Absolutely. I think that the limit of time, what I've noticed personally, especially in Asia, where the, fast is the, the, the pace is very fast, the the, um, the expectation of people is high, but the time is uh, an issue that we need to control as a chef, as a restaurateur. The limit of the meal it will be an hour and a half to two hours for lunch and three to three and a half hours for dinner, but that's it. This is something that is was challenging for me because I didn't expect it at all when we opened the restaurant. Well, so we have to restructure our offer, we have to restructure our menus, reduce the number of courses, and to make sure that we can deliver what we try to deliver with the DNA of the cuisine that we wanted to show to people, but in a limited amount of time. Interesting. So, uh, you next. Uh, something that surprised you, I mean, in the last few years, you've had quite a transition, I think, so I in gastronomy or the fine dining category now. I would say something that surprises me and delights me is the emotional impact food has on people. So, peop the way people respond to authentic food and ingredients has a huge impact on just dining in general. And I think that becomes more and more uh, pointed when everyone's more interested in what the ingredients are, where they're coming from, and how they're being harvested or foraged. And I think that's been one of the most interesting and very, very um, edifying experiences for me. So uh, we're going to come back to that question of authenticity because I think it's an important one, especially um, when we have no time, when we're spending our time um, digesting digital experiences and trying to find a way uh, to make a global community of, of gastronomers or gastronauts um, feel like they've had value from an experience. So I'm uh, really interesting. Alex. Um, what's been surprising to me is that there's 
there's no layup anymore. There's no easy way out for any business person. The, the expectations are extremely high everywhere, not just in fine di dining. Everything's an experience. Everything is documented. Everything's on Instagram. Everything's in a social forum. And if you think, I mean, I, I've kind of, I haven't done the traditional path, but the idea that, well, well, this is a very difficult restaurant to run. Let's just open a little bar on the corner, paper plates. Well, no, you, all you've done is put yourself into a new market, maybe, perhaps, but people are expecting that to be just as awesome mm -hmm. within its own price point, within its own genre. So, uh, let's let's take that concept a little bit. Let's start there. This idea that that my picture that I already Instagrammed of the Shake Shack hamburger um, is equal in many ways in the social sphere to that picture last night of Daniel Hum's duck. Um, what does that mean for fine dining now? How how can those two things be the same um, in an environment where one is a longer, perhaps, <laughs> maybe not for long, uh, experience at multiple hundreds of dollars, and one is a quick hamburger, but the presentation, the performance of them is the same. Jim? I think this gets back to my point about emotional connection to people and how food, how people respond to food. So it could be something so simple as a Shake Shack burger, but when people have it and they have like the perfect combination of meat to bun to whatever, and there's a visceral reaction emotionally and like in your chemically, and then there's Daniel's duck, which has visually stunning appearance, the texture, the quality, and it's also a visceral emotional response to that. Mm -hmm. So I think to Alex's point where he says, yes, there is absolutely no difference from what you open, whether it's the bar down the corner to the next three Michelin star restaurant, people react to food in the same way. And that's kind of what we're learning and adapting to now as restaurateurs and people being in the hospitality world is it could be a burger, it could be something so simple as meat on a stick, or it could be the most incredible five course experience, but it all has to do with authenticity of the experience and how you connect emotionally to your diners. So let's pull that out a little bit into the, this notion of craft, because what, what I'm curious about is that we have another Danielle in this room with a famous duck who did a Danielle Ballou is in the back where I once enjoyed an incredible uh, Canaton à la presse, um, which was resonant with a duck served by Monsieur Terrail, who will be here, whose family's been serving that duck for 150 years or so. Um, and yet, none of that really comes out in a picture of the duck on the plate, uh, per se, right? So that, that trajectory, that history, how do, how do we pull those things into an Instagram photo or um, more broadly into gastronomy now? Julien, you're well, the I most think, traditional I think the, here. the main thing is that the, the information is available and social media really procures um, to us a wide database of picture. And I think what, um, what's important is that this emotional side for the food is linked to something visual most of the time. And because of the wide variety of the information available online and because of people taking pictures of food and sharing pictures of food, I think uh, we react because we have a lot of different options, a lot of different choices and we can compare. Mm. We can compare a picture to another and because of the availability of this information, we basically linked one dish or one picture to one restaurant to one chef. And this is also very important, I think. It's, uh, it has changed, in a way, the, the way the industry is, is working. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fact. We all look at it and... and it being social media has yeah. changed because, because we are sharing these images that we may never even consume yeah, the food. exactly. And I think bef before you might knew of it, but you don't see it physically. And now social media gives us the opportunity to see it, to see the picture. And to be able to, to understand it more and to compare with whatever you're going to eat in different places. Alex, what emotion are you serving? <laughs> um, is confrontation an emotion? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, to, to some of the points made, that they, they made, me, made me think of something which might actually, the idea of Instagram and the idea of um, visual marketing being so important now, it might um, tie in directly to um, a greater resurgence of 
finer presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, like all desserts are supposed to taste good, right? But um, the technical ability of a pastry chef um, to make it something extra mm -hmm. special, well, you can see that in the restaurant, but now it's, um, it's uh, the stakes are greater. Mm because you're, whether you like it or not, that, that, that image is being disseminated um, to thousands or maybe mm. millions. I, I will admit that I follow, as millions do, Cédric Collet, the pastry chef in Paris, and Alain Ducasse, and I, to me it's like pornography. I can't look, if it comes during a meeting, I can't look because I'm embarrassed, because, but it's, it's not because of the image, it's because it's, he's a French pastry chef and I know it's gonna taste good too. So something about this notion of authenticity has to inform uh, our gastronomy, right? It can't just be for visual sake or for, or for uh, even for sh uh, shock sake. No, I, I, I can't and unfortunately, um, perhaps many people are, um, are trying to make it look beautiful without making it delicious, but to me, more to the point of, um, I, I, for me, cuisine, I, I was a pastry chef for many years because I loved that extra ability to um, basically flex, <laughs> I don't know, to, to show that technically you're able to do things, and um, so perhaps a positive side effect is um, increasingly bringing that back into vogue. Mm -hmm. um, the flavor, the, the guts of it, so yes. to speak. Interesting. Uh, what happens in a world where everyone shares uh, our eating experiences, even just visually? What happens to the notion of terroir or authenticity or place or, or is there is there still uh, a value to that in in the food? I mean, you created a restaurant that didn't exist, a restaurant without a restaurant. Some people call them ghost restaurants or whatever. W what is that supposed to taste like? I think this goes back to where we consume things visually. So. Maple put their entire menu daily on pictures on your app and on your camera on your or on your phone or computer screen and so people look at the visual and they are almost tasting that food or making a judgment of what that should taste like based on the picture so I think the idea of authenticity kind of comes from background what you're doing, what's going into the plate itself, and it becomes so important to live up to the expectations of people that see this picture and say, oh, I think it should taste this way, or I feel like this is going to taste like this in my mind. And then to be able to deliver that is not always the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you lose authenticity in that way. But also, I think, to me, ingredients have become more and more important. Mm. Say more about that, why? Because the, uh, like, uh, it goes back to authenticity. The ingredients that we use kind of temper what people visualize. If you say this chicken is from this farmer, from this farm in this state, and it's been raised for this many years, that informs the diner of how this chicken should or was cared for. Same thing with this seaweed was foraged from off the coast of Maine and it was harvested by um, nuns. And <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of, we laugh about it, but especially with this new generation of diners, they are really, really interested in the backstory, mm -hmm. much more so than the actual experience of it because they're, they're consuming things not just as they're putting things in their mouths. They're consuming things visually and viscerally and emotionally. And so that's where authenticity becomes mm -hmm. such an important part of the dining experience. So let's put away our phones for a moment and, and talk about some trends that I think are having um, an equally profound impact on gastronomy um, at every level. Um, and we'll start, you've m given me a, a great segue, actually, uh, to this no notion of ingredients, and I'll broaden it a little bit to talk about sustainability, um, issues and questions that are circulating in the ether about our environment, the impact that our food has on um, the planet, but also on the people who produce it, and some data that we've recently um, discovered through research for our upcoming Food Summit next week, that in the last three years, 67% of Americans in a, an omnibus survey, so across all sectors across the country, have changed the way that they eat. 
um, in the last three years looking for um, better food, whatever that means, healthier food, et cetera. So I'm wondering how, uh, Julianne, does that, how does, well, how does this play into your experience? Yeah. Um, I think this is a, it's a global move that we can see clearly. In my particular, particular case, we are in a, in a small country with very limited agricultural land. So we have to import like pretty much 95% of what we, what we cook, what we, what we produce. Saying that, uh, we have a resource and we have access to a wide range of, of ingredients and farms and producers from all around the world. So how, do we how, do we, how can we claim to be sustainable in that circumstances with, with that fact that we are limited? I think we still have, uh, as a chef, a role to play. Right. And in a way that, um, you know, we can, we can try to control as much as, 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 as we can, for example, our plastic usage as a water, water wastage, mm -hmm. and we can try to teach the, 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 the chef and to, to, to transmit this knowledge of nose to tail kind of, uh, of cooking, mm -hmm. using every single part of the fish or the meat we're gonna use. So this is our little way to, 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 to pay, uh, to pay a, a role into a sustainability uh, um, thing, basically. Alex, do, do your guests do you think, are they concerned with these issues, these values issues, and or do you think as a chef you have a responsibility to lead in these directions? Um, the, the first part, I can only speak to it. Um, I, won't, I only know, I'm only intimate with New York City as a marketplace, sure. which is a very peculiar marketplace, at least hey. for my, <laughs> no, I, well, let's just talk about it. So I, I think a New Yorker might be concerned about that on Monday, and then on Thursday they expect to eat pasta with tomato sauce, and tomatoes are now growing locally. Right. So, like New York, the, the spirit of it always has been, I mean, very far-reaching, so... The individual first. At all. Right. right. I mean, I've also eaten in restaurants that um, claim to be rigidly local in New York City, but I can still get a lime in my gin and tonic. So, um, I, I think there's more to go, but, right. I, but I think that um, certainly chefs, if, if a chef cares about that, certainly they have the responsibility to I mean, you can educate people through something that's delicious, something that's pleasurable, something that's entertaining, and that's the best way to, to educate anyone. Hmm. And, and so uh, do you think, uh, it, outside of authenticity, is there a, a values driver be that about environmental sustainability at the fast casual or delivery level or at the fine dining level that needs to be brought to the front more? I think sustainability means many things and it can take the form of almost anything and it doesn't have to be local to be sustainable. I think you can be just as sustainable highlighting a farming method or sustainable highlighting a certain ingredient from a certain producer. It doesn't matter where that producer is as long as you're staying true to what they're doing and they're passionate about what they're doing. And sustainability, Yes, it's a, it's a catchphrase right now, especially in the fast casual, the quick serve restaurants, the QSRs of this country and other countries as they're developing. But I think sustainability, com sustainability comes in many forms. Mm -hmm. And they, even those quick service restaurants take it very loosely. Mm -hmm. And it's about making sure that the farming practices are good rather than is it from a 400 square mile radius of where we are. Mm -hmm. So I I, I'm smiling because I used to, it, it makes me laugh to think that restaurants, we used to all eat local food and you went to a restaurant to get food from somewhere else, right? Because food was just food and then everything else ca ca came from everywhere. And now we go to those restaurants to eat food from everywhere else and our food we eat normally, so to speak, comes from everywhere else. So something's flipped there, right? Absolutely. And then Restaurants like in Singapore or Colorado, especially at a ski resort where they're getting about 75% mm -hmm. of to 80% of their ingredients from the coast. Mm -hmm. So you're shipping in lobsters from the same lobster lady who has been getting this, these lobsters from Stonington, Maine and has been supporting the community. I think that's just as sustainable mm -hmm. as supporting your local uh, ramp forager. Hmm. And health, should we talk about health for a second? 
uh, because uh, sometimes they're linked together and there's this notion that if it's sustainable, it's better for you. I don't know that that's true. It's, I think, yet to be proven. But, but restaurants at fine dining used to be the place we went to forget health, where, where we just went for a celebration or, or because we could and it didn't matter and tomorrow we'd go back on our diets. And yet we certainly see in New York, and I'm wondering if this is a Tuesday diner or a Wednesday diner or something, where, oh, I want to have this experience at Empion or I want to have this experience at... Um, your restaurant, which the name just Odette, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> or, or that's maybe I need more to eat more healthfully, so I don't forget things. Um, or, but, but yet you are trying to have people get value at a very high level at a at a even if it's quickly. So, so how do you think about health, I, I, or do you at all, or do you think to that's be something to be very honest, when when we build the menus, we don't we don't calculate uh, how many cal calories or, or how many uh, uh, vitamin C D E goes into the menu. But saying that, we can see clearly that there is a, there is a demand for, for health-conscious fine dining. Meaning, uh, well, uh, not just like a few weeks ago, we, we, we do have some people calling the restaurant and ask us, how many calories is your testing menu? <laughs> Which I have no clue, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it's clearly something that we, we need to bring to the table and, and, and have a look at it, because I think the demand will go more and more on that, that particular uh, hmm. direction. Um, in this marketplace, I right. think you have to consider health at every level. So um, I may eat at a three Michelin star restaurant for a special occasion, but in New York City, someone else might, that might just be their restaurant. Uh, right. I mean, uh, show me any of, of the, the, the top echelon restaurants of New York City, and I'm willing to bet that, yes, there's a lot of special occasion, but there's also a lot of regulars, and those businesses are dependent on it. Um, and again, that person might want to indulge sometimes and sometimes they don't at the at the same restaurant so i think it's um critical i mean depending on your menu format to be able to um do different things sometimes for the same person at different times so that you uh, th what you're saying almost resonates with this idea of a restaurant like a cruise ship where anyone can get anything they want within reason i just just show me yeah. just show me a any any restaurant hyper fine like again what does fine dining mean right. at what point at what price does it break to fine dining so i have a restaurant with a 60 dollar check average to me that's not fine dining but to some people that's like that's right, an aspiration like yeah. going to per se and first and i have a 90 dollar check average restaurant and for some people that's fine dining none of those are even close to um you know a, a several hundred dollar tasting menu only place um, but again, show me any restaurant that's been open for a decade, 20 years, 30 years. I'll show you someone who is listening to everything all their customers are saying mm -hmm. and taking care of it. And I think health is definitely one of those concerns. I'm going to ask your question. What is fine dining? <laughs> I think fine dining now is more about what we enjoy uh, and less about the formality of what the experience is. And Fine dining could be Alex's tacos in the corner. Uh, fine dining could be Odette. And fine dining could also be um, the best grilled lobster on the beach at a shack someplace in Indonesia. And it all depends on the experience that you have at that time. And it goes back to the flavors and the authenticity of the ingredients. and the emotional impact it has on the diner. Like people, I think the difference between fine dining and just eating to survive is whether or not people choose to enjoy and really, really be expressive about what they're eating versus they're eating because they're hungry and they need to put something into their mouths. Does Odette have tablecloths? Yes, we do. Why? I thi why? I think because uh, f you asked me fine dining for me. Of course, it goes to the good food and uh, amazing piece of lobster or whatever food we eat. But it still has to come with the packaging. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, because uh, from where I'm from and the way I, I've, I've learned, fine dining, it's also about service. It's also about wine. It's also about taking care of people through uh, genuine hospitality. And it has to come as a package. It's not only about food. It's m food is maybe 50%. Mm -hmm. But another fifty percent is the packaging, and this mm -hmm. is related to uh, what Nicolas said uh, earlier. It's about uh, this savoir-vivre, this uh, this um, notion of pleasure and art de la table. You know, we say uh, uh, we say this in um, in in um, 
in French are de la table, meaning what? Meaning uh, these little details from the plate, from the cutleries, the atmosphere, the music, the temperature, the wine, that's going to make the, dif the, the difference. And that is finally to me. What do you think? Um, I think at its best and in at its purest form, fine dining um, is a, a bit of a magic trick because think about it, I mean, and again, back to expense in varying degrees, but um, there aren't many, what I would say, cheap restaurants that are within the fine dining genre. But regardless of that, I think the best fine dining restaurants, I think true fine dining, it never feels transactional. And you feel taken care of every step of the way. So think about it like going on a roller coaster ride. The second I've gotten in and the bar's down, I'm safe. I'm taken care of. And, and anything I, I could ever want or need. And the best fine dining restaurant, be, like that, that experience starts with the phone call making the reservation. Um, so, and I like thinking of it that way because then it, it frees up many other things of whether you need tablecloths or whether you need flower arrangements or whether, you, whether, whether Mexican cuisine can, can reach this level or another cuisine can, like it, it wipes all that away and it's just how well are you doing it? How well can you make the guest for, forget themselves, forget their problems, forget, forget it, hmm. and just enjoy? Interesting. I, I, it's interesting because I'm thinking of a meal just not, not two weeks ago, $1,000 for dinner, 85 minutes tops, they dropped the check before we asked, and the place was humming and hopping, and I looked around and thought, this, this, is, not, this is not what I think of fine dining, and yet somewhat, lots of people seem to. Yeah, it feels like you had sex, but no one kissed you. <laughs> is that supposed to happen? Oh. Um, let's switch a little bit to, uh, to another aspect of the business, which we keep hearing about. I'll come back to that. <laughs> the, in order to do this, to deliver this transformational, this, this tra to transport people to another area, to another place to remove the transactional nature of it. Uh, you, we need staff. We need people in the kitchen and in the, in the dining room, although that's sort of the uh, topic for the next panel. Um, and how do you, in this current environment, how do you find, train, um, tap into uh, the people that are required, and there's lots of them, and at a very high level, to deliver this fine dining experience? Well, I guess it's hours of training and training and training. And we have to spend time with uh, with people because this, this industry is all about people at the end of the day. So uh, he has to come as a team uh, with a team. He has to come with time, and he has to come with transmission and knowledge. So I guess it's uh, you know you can be the best chef in the world, but if you don't have the right team and the right people around you, you're gonna be nothing at the end. And is is that getting hard? I mean, we hear here in the United States certainly whenever a group of chefs get together, labor is one of the most difficult things for them to find. Well, I guess it's global. Huh? It's, yeah. uh, it, it is difficult. It is difficult to find. And uh, coming back to this kind of, uh, when you say, what is fine dining? It seems like fine dining uh, now is has become a little bit like tacky, a little bit like, like something that is bad. But I think uh, we are wrong and we, we need to come back to be proud of having a fine dining restaurant. It's not tacky, it's not has been, it has to be something that uh, carry on years and years because at the end of the day, we are supposed to to be able to to, to to give knowledge and to transmit uh, these uh, centuries of histories of food, recipes, service, and cuisine to the, to the future generation. So f for me, it's important that uh, fine dining is not tacky. Fine dining is not dead. But, but I, I agree. I think it's important, too. But something has changed, I, I would say. You know, um, actually, it's funny to have Danielle Ballou in the audience because that was the first fine dining restaurant I went to as a puppy at, at college and we dressed up in suits and ties like adults and went to a fancy dinner. Uh, and now all the adults put on jeans and t-shirts and try to go to fancy restaurants and be like the kids, right? So something about, and yet at the same time, the discrepancy in the price of that experience is so much higher than the, the, the taco or the, the takeout lunch, uh, you know, up to as much as $1,000 a person. It's hard to say in this day 
um, an age when uh, you know there are a lot of people who do not have anything like the sixty dollars to aspire to. So so how can it be relevant in that environment where the kids are wearing T-shirts and throwing money like they just won it in Vegas, and yet there's something grander to aspire to, perhaps? Or or how do we reconcile those things? I, I'm not. I'm asking. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer either yet, but I guess it's uh it's again um, being part of what we do and trying to transmit, and it's all about you know connection, people, and knowledge transmission. If you want people to get into this industry, we have to take time to train them and to explain what it takes also. But you what happens when too, they right? don't want to take the time to learn? Because that's been my most recent experience in, so I oversee hotel restaurants mostly right now, and we're talking about anywhere from 100 to 180 restaurant, food and beverage staff, from bartenders, bussers, to cooks and captains and sommeliers. But more and more so, we are seeing that they don't have the follow through or the commitment to show up for their shift, much less take the time to actually learn the craft or the nuances of hospitality. And that's my biggest concern is I feel like I agree with you that fine dining is not dead by any stretch of the imagination, but I think hospitality is changing and what hospitality means is changing, unfortunately. And I think it's super important for all of us here to really, really understand what hospitality means to us and try to convey that to this next generation that's coming up. And it's, it's been a tough thing, to be honest. Alex, come. So I, I'm getting a little confused. Are we talking about definitions of luxury, or are we talking about how millennials don't like to work? Uh, <laughs> I think we're talking about. Because I, I heard two different things. Well, I wanted to add a third: is uh, the luxury in a world where, f uh, f well, more people have access to luxury, but those who don't are farther be below. So two different. I, I think definitions of. I think I'm hearing two points. To me, definitions of luxury are have factually changed, and they will continue to change. So if we can, we can talk about a fine dining model because that's hyper relevant to all this. So I, I feel like currently, at least in what I've experienced, definition of luxury, if once upon a time luxury was, well, I got the corner office, I made it, and I get to wear the suit. Now, to me, luxury is, well, I don't have to go to the office. I can, I can squat with my laptop, and I don't have to wear a suit. So um, how that affects a true fine dining model, well, maybe that means once upon a time bringing 10 different pens to sign the check was awesome, and now it's onerous. Um, that's different than the other thing I was hearing about, I get, like, once upon a time, before I was in kitchens, the generation before me, I mean, I, from what I heard, the sous chef was happy to work for the chef until they died, and that was an honorable profession, and I certainly, my first serious kitchen out of culinary school, I didn't mess with the sous chef, that guy was 36, and he was divorced, and he had kids, and you were scared of him, and now my sous chefs are 22, um, <laughs> and perhaps I, they were made sous chef for different reasons. Um, whether we like it or not, it's going to force you to become a smarter operator. Um, and it's, it's emotional, it's poignant, because you can say, well, well, back when I was in the kitchens, it used to be like this, um, but it, it, it's two things, because, yeah, okay, well, now you're working 40 hours a week when I used to work 80 hours a week, and yes, that, that's, a, that's a better life for you, but the, the scary flip side of that is that are we building the next generation of chefs? Are we building, are, are we, do we even have the ability to build the next generation of hard work of chefs, uh, restaurateurs, sommeliers, um, general managers with, with that do or die mentality? Um, and is that, does, is that what's required? D does fine dining have to be do or die? I, I'm, do we think? It, I, to me, it does. I mean, yeah. like to me, the idea of like, well, I'm gonna mince shallots perfectly, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna saute, it. I'm gonna sweat them into a sauce, and no one's ever gonna see it. So it doesn't matter. Well, no, yeah, it still does matter because if you spend that extra time mincing those shallots, you're gonna be more careful about not spilling any on the floor, and then your floor is gonna be cleaner. And it, it, it's all it's all connected. So, right. so in in cutting corners, mm -hmm. um, that can get a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. 
simultaneously running a tight operational. I mean, New York City minimum wage is going up. Mm -hmm. So $15 will be the new minimum wage, which doesn't mean, well, great, now you all make $15. That means now cooks will make 18 to 24 dollars and it means porters will make 17 dollars which is great does that bring better cooks through it, the door? no it doesn't right. and the, the, the only scary thing about that is that that doesn't correlate directly with you can only raise prices so much it's not like incomes are going up in direct relation to that of people that are eating out right um i don't like these conversations because i try to stay positive about all of it um but it, it's kind of a question of, well, what are we going to do? It's like you're asking someone in the Vietnam War while bullets are still flying by their right. head. Like, we're trying to figure it out right. in, at, in the battlefield. The right. Yeah. Thoughts? I mean, they, Alex, of course, has brought up a few important things here. The, this notion of, of raising, um, well, let's start with the do or die. Is fine dining a do or die profession? I think it is, mm. because we all in this room kind of grew up with that mentality of, doing things perfectly, making sure we um, got the right ingredients and got the perfect reduction on our sauces. And But now it's harder to explain that. And it's not that it's harder to explain it. We can still, we have the language to explain it. It's whether or not this new generation has the capacity and the t attention span to hear it and then absorb it. That's the hard thing. Julian? Well, I can't disagree. I think it's uh, definitely require um, a certain amount of sacrifice and discipline, and some people can take it, and some people just can't take it. So after it's uh, really individual, and we have to, you know, we have to deal with that, unfortunately. So after that uh, ambition, that expression, that do or die ness, what's the reward? What is the gastronomic reward for those, for you guys, for us doing it? Uh, the reward is simple. The reward is the passion of. Uh, of the team, the reward is the smile on every guest, and the reward is uh, is that we can give emotion to people, and this is priceless, and is one of the only industry in the world where we are able to do it twice a day. Interesting. Um, I, I want to change topics a little bit because I would be remiss not to bring it up. Um, where are the goddesses of food? Sorry. Are you asking me? I'm, well, you're, you're here as a goddess of food. 19% um, of executive chefs in America are women, and that includes in food service, contract food service, 7% in restaurants, independent restaurants. Um, I think it's a matter of competition, and women tend to shy away from competition or being... Do or die thing? Being, well, not the do or die uh -huh. thing, because women are just as passionate sure. and just as focused and dedicated. It's the, it's a rough and tumble world, especially fine dining. And it's so full of testosterone and competition and just constantly trying to hold ground. And I think women in general naturally are givers and so we'd rather pacify, we'd rather smooth things over, and we want things to overall be peaceful rather than confrontational. So it's our, in my experience, the women that I've worked with throughout my career have chosen softer ways of going about things. So they, they are still chefs or they are still in the industry, but they go about it without making as much noise or uh, trying to bring as much attention to themselves. Alex, is testosterone an ingredient in your kitchen? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I started as a line cook and I, I weaseled my way into pastry because more girls worked there. So I thought <laughs> I had a better chance of... Um, That's something. <laughs> Um, no, th it's always a touchy subject. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, the, my new restaurant, um, the, the kitchen is 20% female, which is actually pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, for the record, I'm down about seven positions right now, and if all seven of them were female, I would hire them all right now. It, right. It, that's not a thing. Um, Get your resumes it, ready, everybody. It, it's a touchy subject because, for, from my perspective, it's not, well, are you male, are you female? It's just more, we need more people. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I mean, it... it I, I went to culinary school and my, my class was, you know. It's half women, it's a little bit more than half women, but they don't end up cooking. Um, my, my particular class was not. Oh. My, mine was much lower, but that might have been an, an anomaly. Mm. Um, but I've never, it, it, it's touchy in many ways. My, my wife's a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, and 
she she's battled with things in the kitchen. The idea, of it, 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 I, I don't want to go too deep into it, okay. just because um, I don't want to I don't want to offend anyone. But sometimes I feel like there's certain truths that um, people aren't willing to hear. Julian, French chef working in Asia. How many women are in your kitchen? Uh, I've got like four four ladies in the kitchen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our pastry chef is a is a woman, and um, well, I have no. For me, it's the same. It's like uh, it's all about indi individual and what you can do, what you can't do. And uh, when you have a brilliant people, whether it's a man or a woman, doesn't make uh, any difference. So I treat everybody the same way, and uh, I think it's just normal way to do. Okay, um, we're we're nearing the end, and I I think. The, the panel's called Gastronomy Now, but of course we're here to think about the future. And um, we have seen um, tremendous changes happen uh, in, uh, I'll call them trends, but they're almost more like waves of interest in uh, food from certain places, influences of certain chefs um, from those places, or even philosophies of cooking that have come and moved through and not gone as much as receded. And I'm wondering, from your three very different uh, per positions, perspectives, uh, what you see in this future of gastronomy and also what you would like of the next generation. So it's a two-part question, um, but why don't I start with you, Zola? I think what Julian said about people, more and more people asking about the healthfulness of food will it's not so much a trend, but it's it's going to be a bigger part of fine dining and gastronomy. People want to be healthier. People want to feel like they're eating better. And then um, I think the next step, the evolution of gastronomy is, like, I guess, trying to connect more to what people want to experience. And part of it being healthful, part of it being Fast. Fast, right. yeah. Um, Alex? Um, I, I, I'd, like, I'd like the melting pot to continue to melt um, for, for convenient purposes, whether this is a misuse of the term ethnic, but like I'll, I'll say any cuisine that wasn't yours of your place, it, it, you're an outsider to it, mm -hmm. it it's ethnic. And um, I, I think tradition and authenticity, authenticity are important, but I also think that they are documented. And I think those things that once upon a time were traditional authentic, once upon a time they were radically new. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at French cuisine as an ethnic cuisine, um, it's been one that's been able to, uh, traditional French cuisine of all sorts still exists in France, and yet it's been able to move through um, all sorts of different modes and different ways of approaching and absorb cult, um, quiz, um, foods from other cultures into its fold. And I like seeing the pendulum swing both ways. So if right now everything is hyper local, hyper of the place, um, that's great. But I'd like to see it swing back to the other way and people to remember that anything of your place once upon a time was not of your place. And that you're starting to see cracks in that, I have to say, in the rhetoric around yes, suddenly um, I'm not interested if it's local, it just has to be good. I, um, I've seen and new ideas, um, there there's still an infinite amount of them. That, that could occur, so. Are you going to stay, just out of curiosity, in the Mexican idiom, if not? Uh, sure, but also not. Like, I mean, if I were to open up a restaurant tomorrow, let's just say I, all the empeones burned down and I opened up a new restaurant, we'll call it Plan B, restaurant Plan B. <laughs> um, I would still reach for corn masa and I would still reach for tortillas, not necessarily because they're Mexican any longer, but because of the awesomeness of them. Mm. Um, They're yours now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, and I mean, there's a million ways I could lobby. I, I could lobby for them, but again, it, like for me, I, I, I hope it's it's just um, a greater sense of freedom as as things don't make sense. What is fine dining anymore? No one to employ in the kitchen. Um, with all that, I think their um, creative madness and, and freedom is extremely welcome. I'd like to th see things get more confused, more muddled. Mm. Fun, Julian. The future. Well, I'll go back to I'll go back to this uh, this trend of of uh, health conscious eating, which is already big, and I think is the is really the next move that uh, mm. we all have to be uh, conscious about, and 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 we will have to work on on it. And the second thing is, I think uh, whether it's a fast food or or, or sandwiches, tacos, or fine dining, whatever, I think what people really look forward it's uh, sincerity, it's sincerity in the way we approach mm. people. 
and it's the way that the food is food is a is a way of uh, language somehow, and I think the the fact of procuring a genuine hospitality to people to something very honest, very personal, and very sincere. This is what I look for. I think that's a beautiful place to stop. Uh, not uh, to take that notion of authenticity and move it to the concept of sincerity. I think is a really uh, mindful thing to think about. So thank you all for being part of this interesting conversation. There's lots more to talk about, but I hope among the group here thank we'll you. continue to have <laughs> interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you.